seeking to be pruned. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does he prunes so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. John 15 verses 1 to 3. Pruning a vine is an important part of helping it to grow and produce not only more fruit but the best fruit. If left unpruned, a grape vine will eventually produce less fruit and poorer quality fruit. Good pruning helps to direct the nourishment of the vine to the new buds that are most fruitful. Jesus' teaching above uses the imagery of pruning a vine to help us understand that faith must lead to charity. First, Jesus says that he is the true vine. He is the only source of the nourishment we need for the new life of grace. He is the only way to heaven and salvation. Knowing our Lord and being attached to him firmly is faith. Second, our Lord says that he takes away every branch that does not bear fruit. This indicates that faith without the good fruit of charity is dead and is like a branch on a vine that produces nothing. Third, when Jesus finds a branch that bears good fruit, he doesn't leave it alone. Instead, he prunes it with loving attention so that it bears more fruit. To apply these teachings to your own life, begin by looking at your faith as if it were a branch firmly attached to a vine. Do you believe all that God has spoken through his holy word? It is useful to regularly examine your conscience in regard to your faith. Since faith is the first step in the spiritual life, it must remain firmly grounded in the truth God has revealed. This means we must regularly study the Word of God as it is revealed through the scriptures and the catechetical teachings of the Church and assent to those teachings with all our mind. Next, after affirming your faith in all that God has spoken through the scriptures and the Church, try to examine your charity. Do you see concrete acts of love in your life that result from your faith? In other words, we can love the many things in a purely emotional sort of way. But charity is based on faith, not on how we feel. Charity is the fruit of faith. What acts of charity can you point to in your life? What have you sensed God calling you to do in a selfless and sacrificial way? Have you done it? Finally, when you discover the ways that charity is alive within you, know that God will focus his pruning there. Pruning can be painful. It will require sacrifice, patience in the face of trial, overcoming selfishness, and doing things you don't feel like doing. In fact, sometimes God even makes charitable acts seem unpleasant as a way of pruning your motivations and making them more pure, based more on faith than on emotion. But this is good. Reflect, today, upon this holy imagery from Jesus. It's a lesson from nature that reveals the supernatural life of grace at work. Don't be deterred by the pruning God wants to do. Embrace suffering with love, respond to injustice with forgiveness, offer mercy when you don't feel like it, and seek to serve selflessly those who seem undeserving. Doing so will prune you so that God will be able to build up his kingdom in glorious ways through you. Jesus, most glorious vine, you and you alone are the source of all nourishment in life. From you all good things come. Help me to have a firm faith in you and all that you have revealed, so that this faith will bud forth and bring about an abundance of good fruit for the glorious building up of your kingdom. Jesus, I trust in you. April 28th, 2024, fifth Sunday of Easter. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him not believing that he was a disciple. Then Barnabas took charge of him and brought him to the apostles. And he reported to them how he had seen the Lord and that he had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. He moved about freely with them in Jerusalem and spoke out boldly in the name of the Lord. He also spoke and debated with the Hellenists, but they tried to kill him. And when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him on his way to Tarsus. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria was at peace. It was being built up and walked in the fear of the Lord, and with the consolation of the Holy Spirit, it grew in numbers. The Word of the Lord.
who fear the Lord, the lowly shall eat their fill. They who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your hearts live forever. I will praise you, Lord, in the ascent. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall bow down before him. I will praise you, Lord, in the ascent. To him alone shall bow down all who sleep in the earth. Before him shall bend all who go down into the dust. I will praise you, Lord, in the ascent. And to him my soul shall live, my descendants shall serve him. Let the coming generation be told of the Lord, that they may proclaim to a people yet to be born the justice he has shown. I will praise you. A reading from the first letter of St. John. Children, let us love not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. Now this is how we shall know that we belong to the truth and reassure our hearts before him in whatever our hearts condemn. For God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence in God and receive from Him whatever we ask, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And His commandment is this, we should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us. Those who keep His commandments remain in Him and He in them, and the way we know that He remains in us is from the Spirit He gave us. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does, he prunes so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. 
the Gospel of the Lord. St. Louis Grignian de Montfort, Priest, Optional Memorial 1673-1716 Patron Saint of Preachers Canonized by Pope Pius XII on July 20, 1947 Liturgical color, white Version, full short Quota I declare with the saints, Mary is the earthly paradise of Jesus Christ the new Adam, where he became man by the power of the Holy Spirit, in order to accomplish in her wonders beyond our understanding. She is the vast and divine world of God where unutterable marvels and beauties are to be found. She is the magnificence of the Almighty where he hid his only Son, as in his own bosom, and with him everything that is most excellent and precious. What great and hidden things the all-powerful God has done for this wonderful creature, as she herself had to confess in spite of her great humility, the Almighty has done great things for me. From True Devotion by St. Louis Delaware Montfort Reflection Louis Grignian was the second of 18 children born to Jean-Baptiste and Jean-Robert Grignian in the small town of montfort sur mayeu northwest France. Several of their children died in infancy, including the firstborn, leaving Louis as the oldest of the surviving siblings. He was given the name Louis at his baptism and later added Marie to his name at his confirmation, a fitting name for one who would later become the definitive source on total consecration to Jesus through Mary. Louis's parents were strong Catholics. Three of their sons became priests, and two of their daughters became nuns. However, the family was not without difficulties. Louis's father had a fierce temper, and Louis was often the recipient of his outbursts. His father longed for wealth and prestige, yet he could not pull the family out of poverty, which often left him frustrated. His father's outbursts affected Louis such that he himself was tempted with the same vice throughout his life. Nonetheless, those who knew Louis as a child saw him as an angelic boy whose spiritual depth was beyond his years. His deep compassion for his mother, who also suffered from her husband's outbursts, was also well noted. Perhaps it was this compassion for his mother that later led him to a profound devotion to the Blessed Mother. When he turned 12, Louis Marie was sent to the nearby town of Rennes, where he entered a large free school run by the Jesuits. He remained there for about eight years and completed his elementary education, as well as courses in philosophy and theology. During those years, Louis lived a virtuous life, had a strong love for the poor and sick, practiced severe penances, became devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the angels, and prayed often. His mother's brother, a priest in Wren, later remarked that Louis was so virtuous that he almost appeared immune from Adam's sin. At that time, he also enjoyed listening to stories from a local priest about his missionary work as an itinerant preacher. This fueled a desire in Louis's heart for the same. In 1893, at the age of 20, Louis's dream of the priesthood moved forward. He received a scholarship from a benefactor to study in Paris at the famed seminary of St. Sulpice. The school was about 200 miles away from his home, and his father wanted him to arrive in style. He offered Louis a horse, money, and new clothing. Louis, however, wanted to walk to Paris as penance and to do so in poverty, so he rejected the horse but reluctantly accepted the money and new clothing. On his journey, he gave away all his money to the poor, exchanged his new clothing for tattered rags, and begged for food. When he finally arrived in Paris, he discovered that the benefactor had not given enough money for him to enter and reside at St. Sulpice, so he obtained modest boarding elsewhere and instead attended school at Sorbonne University for the next two years. Though his meager accommodations and diet were penitential in and of themselves, he continued to add to these mortifications through his own acts of penance. Two years later, after recovering from a serious illness, he was able to move into the poorer accommodations offered at St. Sulpice and complete his studies while working at the school library. As a librarian, Louis Marie became very familiar with some of the greatest books of theology, especially on Mariology. His faith and devotional practices grew so strong that some of the worldly clergy ridiculed him, thinking him to be a fraud. His frequent visits to the chapel before and after every class, his profound devotion to Mary, his penances, and his loving devotion to the poor and infirm made him stand out. After completing his studies, he was ordained a priest but not given faculties to preach or hear confessions. Eventually, he was invited to assist a priest in Nantes, just south of where he grew up. Over the next six years, Father Louis had a series of ups and downs. 
He was especially drawn to the poor and worked on and off as a chaplain at a hospital for the poor. On a spiritual level, his ministry was a great success and the people loved him, especially those who were poor. However, he continually met with opposition from some of the worldly clergy and the social elite, so he was forced to move over and over again, even being without an assignment for a year. Finally, in 1706, discouraged by his ministerial struggles, he decided to walk 1,000 miles to Rome to consult with the Holy Father. On June 6, he was granted an audience with Pope Clement XI who saw through the veneer of this impoverished beggar priest and perceived his God-given vocation. The Holy Father appointed him as apostolic missionary and sent him back to France. Over the next 10 years, Father Louis thrived in his new ministry. He began preaching missions from town to town, regularly performed miracles, encountered apparitions of our Blessed Mother, lived a life of extreme poverty and penance, constructed Calvary grottos to foster devotion, and won the hearts of countless people. He confronted the heresies of the day, rejoiced in every persecution he endured, even attempts on his life by heretics, and remained faithful to the commission he was given by Our Lady through the Pope. Though he continued to endure persecution from the local bishop and clergy, he pressed on. Toward the end of his life, Father Lewis wrote a rule of life for a community of priests and brothers, but that community was never fully established before his death. In the years after his death, however, the seeds he planted evolved into two strong communities that continue to thrive today, the Daughters of Wisdom and the Company of Mary. His most enduring legacy would not become known to the Church for more than a century after his death. During his life, Father Lewis wrote several books and many hymns. His books remained unknown until April 22, 1842, when a priest of the community he founded discovered the manuscripts in an old trunk. Soon after, his writings on the Blessed Virgin Mary, especially True Devotion, Secrets of Mary, and Secrets of the Rosary, became among the most widely loved and influential Marian books ever written. Since then, six popes have honored St. Louis Delaware Montfort and praised his writings and virtues. St. Pope John Paul II even took his papal motto from the saint's writings, Totus Tus, Totally Yours. St. Louis Delaware Montfort lived for God alone, by consecrating himself totally to God through the instrumentality of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was poor, penitential, devout, and fully committed to the salvation of souls and the care of the poor. Miracles accompanied his ministry, and, when the time was right, the Holy Spirit introduced the Blessed Virgin Mary more fully to the world through him. As we ponder this great saint today, reflect upon your own devotion to our Blessed Mother. Saint Louis believed that the quickest and safest way to Jesus was through the Blessed Mother. Consider reading through his consecration found in his work, True Devotion, so that Saint Louis' profound faith will also spark deep faith in your life. Prayer, St. Louis Marie, throughout your life you endured many hardships. You endured your father's outbursts, received mockery from worldly clergy, and struggled to fulfill your vocation. Through it all, you deepened your devotion to our Blessed Mother and entrusted yourself to God alone through her. Please pray for me, that I may live for God alone by consecrating myself totally to Jesus through Mary in imitation of you. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, pray for me. Jesus, I trust in you.